It was June 23rd, 1985. Air India Flight 182 departed from Toronto in Canada. It was headed to Mumbai. The flight was a Boeing 747, a wide-bodied jumbo jet. The plane was named after an Indian emperor. It was called Kanishk. Before Mumbai, Kanishk had a few stops. The first was in Montreal. Canadian officials searched the plane. They removed three suspicious packages. And then it was on to London. That's the second stop before flying to Mumbai. But Flight 182 never made it to London. Around 45 minutes before its arrival, the plane vanished. It disappeared from the radar. No communication, no distress signal. Simply vanished. Its last location was just off the Irish coast. So an emergency crew was dispatched. And what did they find? Debris. There was an explosion mid-air and the jet disintegrated. There were 329 people on board. All of them were killed. Only 131 bodies were recovered from the sea. Canada suspected a Khalistani hand. Just one year ago, in 1984, Operation Blue Star had happened in India. The Indian Army had breached the Golden Temple. They killed Khalistani terrorists lodged inside. So Canada connected the dots. They realized the plane bombing was revenge. But how many people did they punish for this attack? One. Just one accused was convicted in this case. The mastermind himself was let off. Which makes you wonder, what exactly happened? How did Canadian intelligence not know about this attack? How were bombs carried onto the plane? And how did the terrorists escape justice? Time for a flashback. The story of this bombing begins with one man, Talvinder Singh Parmar. He was a Khalistani terrorist. He founded a terror group called Babbar Khalsa. And in 1985, he plotted the Kanishk bombing. But his journey begins much earlier. In 1970, Parmar moved to Canada. Six years later, he became a citizen. Now, most people immigrate for a fresh start. Parmar immigrated for a cover, a cover to carry on his anti-India activities. In 1981, he was accused of killing policemen in Punjab. Parmar fled to Germany. He was arrested by German authorities. But they refused to extradite him. So Parmar spent around one year in jail. Eventually, he was let off the hook. When he went to Canada, India tried again. Canada was asked to hand him over, to extradite him. It should have been a routine process. Canada and India were friendly nations, also Commonwealth members. But their prime minister, Pierre Trudeau had other plans. He rejected the extradition, and his reason was pathetic. Pierre Trudeau apparently did not think that India was deferential enough to the Queen, so no extradition. Canada would pay dearly for this mistake. Now we come to 1985. The attack on the Golden Temple had riled up Parmar. He was talking about revenge, and Air India was the obvious target. Indians in Canada would often talk about it. They knew that something big was going to happen and some would say, don't take an Air India flight. These murmurs reached Canadian intelligence, but they never took it seriously. Meanwhile, Parmar was busy plotting. He needed someone to make the bomb and he settled on this man, Inderjeet Singh Rayat. Rayat was a fellow Khalistani. He doubled up as a car mechanic in Vancouver Island. So with the right manuals, he could make a bomb. And he did. Riyadh ended up making two of them. One was for Kanishk, the second was for another Air India plane, a Tokyo-Bangkok jet. We'll get to that later. Canadian intelligence had many chances to prevent this attack. I'll tell you about one instance. Days before the bombing, Canadian spies were tailing Talvinder Parmar. They followed him to a forest. And once there, they heard explosions. Parmar and his aides were testing out the bombs. Guess what the Canadian spies did? Nothing. They thought the explosion was a gunshot. If only they had acted then, hundreds of lives could have been saved. But then again, Canada would get many more chances. After building the bomb, it was time to plant it. This is where an anonymous passenger comes in. Someone called Manjeet Singh. Now, we don't know who he was. We also don't know what he looked like. Chances are his name was fake. Manjeet Singh had booked a ticket on the same flight. The day before the attack, he also called the airlines because he was on the waiting list. Doesn't matter, he said. Check in my bag anyway. He deceived an air agent into putting his bag onto the plane. The passenger himself never came. You would think this is the hard part. Getting a bomb onto a plane, it should be tough, right? But thanks to Canada's top-class airport security, it wasn't. 
For starters, the sniffer dogs were not around. They had training that day. What about the x-ray machines, apparently broken down? And the handheld sniffers? They did beep around the bag, but the security officials missed the warning. They were not trained to read it. So the bag with a bomb inside was placed in the aircraft. And when it reached near Ireland, it exploded. Now, I mentioned a second bomb. This one was placed on a flight to Tokyo. From Tokyo, it was supposed to be put on an Air India flight. But this bomb exploded early. Two baggage handlers in Japan were killed. Apparently, Parmar and his accomplices got the timing wrong. Canada uses something called daylight saving time. They put their clocks one hour ahead during summer. Japan does not do that. And this time difference led to the early explosion. Back to Kanishk now. After the attack, Canada was slow to react. Air India flew the victims' families from Canada to London. When they reached there, they were shocked. There was no one from Canada present, no one to help them. The investigation was even worse. Parmar went underground after the attack. By 1988, he was in Pakistan. Now, with Parmar gone, Canada focused on three other people. Inderjeet Singh Riyadh, the bomb maker, Ajayb Singh Bagri, Parmar's man Friday, and Ripu Daman Singh Malik, the third accused. In 1991, Riyadh was charged with possession of the bomb. Just one problem, though. There was no proof. Canada could not make the charges stick. One year later, Parmar was captured in India, but he was killed in custody. So another dead end. By 1995, the Canadians were desperate. They were offering massive rewards. One million dollars in exchange for information, and it worked. A Sikh journalist turned up with a smoking gun. He claimed to have heard conversations between the accused. But in 1998, he was murdered. His killers yet to be found. So in 2005, when the trial ended, there was just one conviction, that of Riyadh, the bomb maker. He pleaded guilty to manslaughter. Let me repeat that, manslaughter for an act of terrorism. The other two accused walked out as free men. It was a case of gross injustice. Witnesses had been murdered, silenced or bought. Evidence had been destroyed and terrorists were let off the hook. The trial itself went into the record books. It dragged on for two decades. It cost around $130 million, the most expensive trial in Canada's history. But what was the point? In the end, those who were guilty walked away. Only Canada is to blame for what happened. They had specific details about the threat to Air India. Their former spy master confirmed this. James Bartleman. He says he got a classified document before the bombing. It said an Air India flight would be targeted that weekend and the same weekend Kanishka was bombed. So why did Canada not act? The spy master says he handed over the information to security officials, but later Canada made a U-turn. They said Bartleman was lying, that he was misleading the victims' as families. Now, we can't be sure why Canada ignored so many red flags. Did race have something to do with it? If you ask some commentators, that is the case. After the Kanishk bombing, Canada's Prime Minister called his Indian counterpart. And what he did was strange. He offered condolences to the Indian Prime Minister. It may sound normal, so why was it strange? Because 280 of the victims were Canadian citizens. Most were of Indian origin, but they were Canadian. Only 24 were Indian citizens. If anyone should have extended condolences, it should have been the Indian Prime Minister. So the attitude was quite clear. The plane was Indian, the victims were of Indian origin, and the attackers motivated by Indian separatism. So Canada thought, not our problem. It was only in 2010 that they realized their mistake. Canada's then Prime sanctions. Minister said sorry. Syria, Many called it a reset in India-Canada relations. But 13 years later, we are back to square one. The culprits of 1985 may be gone, but their ideology remains. It was Pierre Trudeau shielding them in the 1980s. It's his son, Justin Trudeau, now. The Kanishk bombing revealed the truth about separatism and terrorism, a truth all of us know. Their target can be one country or community, but they will spread everywhere. There are no borders or loyalties for terrorism. It's a lesson Justin Trudeau is yet to learn.